Dr. Brian Fields, the space cowboy, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> who, is, who is here to talk with us um, along with Samantha Brush, graduate student in astronomy. Um, I will say I, a little story about Brian Fields. Oh, no. He went with us, with Misty Folk, to a school, and I've forgotten where. Probably Kank elementary school. Where Kank was it? Was it Kankakee? Probably Kankakee. Let's yeah. say it was Kankakee. So it was an elementary school. But what I remember clearly was Brian had three presentations. The first one to kindergartners oh, and yeah, first graders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. The second one to second and third graders. And the third one to fourth and fifth graders. Three different presentations, and all the kids were just entranced with the, and they did hands-on activities, moving, et cetera, and it was, it was fabulous. So there are some scientists who just have this knack for doing engagement with schools, and Brian is one of them. And uh, I'm delighted that he's back to do a talk with us on what we're learning from the eclipse. So without further ado, All right. Brian Fields. Well, thank oh, you. Oh, please sign in if you yes. Yes. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, George, for that very kind introduction. I was afraid of what you were going to say. Um, and, uh, uh, and thank you all for your patience, because this had to be rescheduled. The upside of this is uh, that means because of the rescheduling, you get two servings of pizza while only have to tolerate one serving of me, so the ratio is very good. Um, so indeed, we just had this amazing eclipse. And so George uh, kindly asked uh, for us to talk about uh, some of the science that comes out of eclipses. And uh, it was an amazing experience, an amazing teaching and outreach uh, act, uh, opportunity. Um, and so there's lots of, so it was great for popularizing science, getting people excited about science, getting people to do science. Um, but it also is, was an opportunity for, for research, to learn new things. And we're learning a ton of new things about how the eclipse affected the, the Earth and the people on the Earth. Uh, so the effects on the atmosphere, uh, effects on animals and plants and insects, and all the kind of sociology that went along with all of that, the effects on all the people and traffic jams. And that's all really interesting and not what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what I want to talk about is how eclipses, in addition to all of that, all that we learn, they also are laboratories and they're a place to, to learn about things that are really fundamental about the universe. Um, okay, but before I again, I, I, want to, uh, uh, I want to properly, George had a chance to embarrass me, so now I get to embarrass him. Uh, so I've had the great good fortune to know George for quite some time now, decades. And uh, almost my entire time at Illinois, I've known George. Um, and my initial, my initial interaction with him is I had an NSF grant, and there was an education component to it, and that's what I was up to. And I had this whole thing planned out, and it completely fell on its face. It totally and utterly failed. I was trying to reach out to teachers. I didn't know what I was doing, and it completely and utterly failed. And happily, somebody pointed me to George, and then George kindly let me get involved with Misty and going to talk to teachers, and, uh, and the rest is history. So, uh, so I'm, I'm infinitely grateful for that, um, because not only did George save my bacon, but uh, he also encouraged me to care about uh, bringing science to, uh, uh, to teachers and educators. And, uh, and, that's, uh, and, and today is, uh, uh, is, uh, is a consequence of that. OK, so we had this amazing eclipse. So I got to ask, who, who saw the eclipse? So good, everybody saw the eclipse. Did anybody see, so and did some people get to go to totality to get the full experience? Oh good, I'm still seeing a lot of hands. So that was, that was amazing, was it not? Um, so, uh, and so, when, so, so there was a lot to take in during totality. Did anybody notice that you could actually see a few planets? So could people notice that? So we'll come back to that. So you could, if you, if you had sharp eyes, well, there was one really bright planet. You could see uh, Venus very bright. And there were some stars that were also, uh, also vi visible as well if you look closely. Um, if you didn't get a chance to go to totality, no worries. There's a do-over in seven years. Uh, and it'll come through southern Illinois again. And uh, uh, as well as it'll go, it's, it'll go all the way from Mexico to, um, to, uh, to Canada. Um, so, and it was deeply encouraging to see such widespread interest in science uh, and uh, a great opportunity to do outreach. Um, and, uh, uh, and indeed, 
we, it certainly was the most viewed eclipse in United States history because after all it went coast to coast. It's certain, you know, because of social media, it, it certainly was the most viewed eclipse in US history and, uh, and I don't know yet if it was the most viewed eclipse ever. Um, but in any case, a ton of people saw it and the astronomy department used this as an opportunity for outreach and we, uh, uh, we talked to, and we doesn't mean me, means our outreach group, means people like Samantha Thrush here, talked to upwards of 7,000 students before, uh, all across the state before the, the eclipse. And so just to give you a sense of some, of some of the fun we had, so here with our beautiful eclipse glasses, that's the football team, there's Lovey Smith. They didn't get to go to Southern Illinois, but they still saw the eclipse. And then us in Southern Illinois, we had a great time. So, all right. Um, so now I want to give you a sense, though, of some of the science that comes out of eclipses. They're not just beautiful, they're deeply moving, and they're an emotional experience, but they're also a golden opportunity and a unique opportunity for science. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about, uh, you have to start with Einstein, is general relativity. Einstein's theory of general relativity and how that's intimately intertwined with eclipses. Um, so, uh, and it's true, and, and, the, and, and we'll see that an eclipse was truly revolutionary in that it's, eclipses made Einstein what, what, what we know as Einstein. Um, so it's the most exquisite example I have, so I have to start with that. All right, so to explain uh, about Einstein, I need to uh, tell you a little bit about gravity. Um, so our story starts uh, before Einstein, we go back to Galileo. So, uh, so Galileo, as you know, is the famous uh, you know, Italian physicist and astronomer and one of the founders of modern science. And uh, he did his work in, in Tuscany, in Pisa. And so uh, the legend has it, it's not clear if this is actually true, but of course there's the Leaning Tower of Pisa and, uh, um, and it was leaning back at the time. And the legend has it that he did his famous experiment by going to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and doing the following experiment about gravity. He was very interested in motion and gravity. Uh, in particular, the motion when gravity is, the, is the, uh, the only thing acting, which is known as free fall. And so he did this very interesting experiment. Now, this is in Tuscany, remember, so it's in the heart of Italy where they, uh, they eat well. And so his experiment was, so there, there's, there's Galileo. So he climbs up to the top of the, the tower and, uh, and then he brings with him, it's Tuscany, so he had a, a piece of pizza, just like we have over there, and then a big cask of uh, Chianti wine. And so, uh, so he gets these two things, which are different shapes, different sizes, different weights, different masses. And he does this interesting experiment. There, food is so plentiful then that uh, he can afford to just throw them over the side of the Tower of Pisa. And he does this, and of course the interesting result is that he finds that they land at the same time. So the, 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 the more compa compact cask actually lands a little bit before they basically land at the same time. And that's a big deal because Aristotle would have told you, oh, no, no, uh, the, the heavier thing uh, should uh, fall much faster and hit the ground uh, first. And lo and behold, they, they landed at the same time. And so that's this remarkable experiment that Galileo did. Um, and, uh, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then he drew some conclusions about that. So, so this result is familiar, and I, I encourage you to do this. I wouldn't waste pizza. I wouldn't go do it with the pizza we have now, but if you get two balls uh, or, uh, or you know, uh, people you don't like and drop them from, you, you'll see that this works. Um, and so Galileo then uh, uh, got interested in this, and he said, well, look, what's going on? Well, so I'm dropping these two objects. They're starting at rest, and they're gaining speed, so they're accelerating, and no matter what I drop, Everything moves the same way. It lands at the same time. It starts from the same rest and ends up moving in the same time and same speed. So objects in free fall, in other words, when gravity is the only thing going on, objects in free fall have the same acceleration. So that was his famous conclusion. And uh, so that's interesting. That seems to be a property of gravity. Newton comes along and Newton said, oh, OK, the reason, I'll tell you why that's true. So Newton said, well, you see what's going on is there's this force of gravity, uh, and gravity is grabbing onto the mass of these objects, and the bigger the mass, the, the stronger the gravity, the more the weight. So you know that, more massive objects are more heavier, duh. 
But then also, uh, uh, these objects also have inertia. The more mass, the harder it is to get them ex to accelerate. And those two things exactly cancel. The gravitational mass and inertial mass are the same. So for the experts out there, there's an equivalence between gravity, gravitational mass and inertial mass. And that's an interesting thing, but that's just a peculiarity of gravity. So Einstein, and for years, for deck, for hundreds of years, that was the last word. I, Newton says, well, look, gravitational mass and inertial mass are the same, so we just call it mass. Then Einstein comes along, and he thinks about this problem very carefully, and he says, no, I think, I agree with this experiment. Experiment is the arbiter of science, so I agree with the result. The experiment has to be right. It, it tells you how the universe works, but I interpret it in a very different way. So Einstein says, no, when I look at this, here's what I conclude. Gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. So, uh, so you, when you drop these things and they feel gravity, they accelerate, and he says, I think that what's really going on is things fall the same way because that's deeply a property of the universe. In fact, it's a property of space and time, and so, uh, so, gravity, so if, if gravity causes them to accelerate, gravity and acceleration are really the same. And that's a strange idea, but he calls this the equivalence principle. There is no way to distinguish between gravity and acceleration. If you're in a closed room, uh, you can't tell whether that close, you can't look out the window and see the rest of the universe. You can't tell if you're in a closed room whether you're feeling gravity or whether you're in a rocket ship that's accelerating. That's what he means by the equivalence principle. So in this room, he would say, if you can't look out the room, you can't get on the, your cell phone and find out what's going on outside, you can't tell. He says, it's not that you're not smart enough. There is no experiment you can do that will tell you whether you're in a room uh, that's feeling gravity because there's a planet underneath it, or you're in a rocket ship that's accelerating with an acceleration that's the same as 9.8 meters per second squared. Please, yes, please ask questions. Two things that you addressed. One is, um, experiment is the arbiter of science. Yep. So that implies a, a definition of science. It's pretty clear. Um, and the other thing you said is, there is no experiment you can do that will. That will, that will distinguish okay. these. So any experiment I do will, will not be able to tell the difference between gravity and acceleration. That's Einstein's claim. All right, and and uh, will and has consequences if that's really true. So the moment this is just theory, uh, and we're going to test the theory. Yeah. And, and so the, the assertion is that science is that which experiment can determine. Right. Okay. It's not only experiment, but experiment is the final arbiter. F Richard Feynman fi famously said, "Experiment is the final arbiter." Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What I was thinking about this. Yeah. And, yeah. And and so what Einstein, the theory guy, right. is saying is here's an environment at which there is a result that is for which I, or a predicted result. Yeah, so he's going to make predict. So, no so he's, they're both looking at the same experiment. Newton has one way of explaining it. Gravitational mass and inertial mass are the same. It's all about forces. Uh, 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 Einstein's going to say it's not about forces at all. Uh, but I haven't yet explained how that's going to work, but, but he's saying that uh, when I see this experiment, my interpretation is gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. You can't tell in a room whether it's whether it's experiencing gravity or experiencing acceleration. But now, I, I want to flesh, he said more than this, and I want to flesh out, with a con this is a crazy idea, and I'm going to flesh out the consequences, or one consequence of it. Okay, so, so we're now going to take seriously this idea that you can't tell the difference, if you're in a room, you can't tell the difference between whether it's sitting on a planet or it's an accelerating rocket ship floating in space. Um, and so we're going to do a thought experiment. Einstein was wonderful with these thought experiments. So first of all, so here's this thing. It's either a house or it's a rocket ship. And it's just sitting still, minding its own business. And then this is, there's no gravity here, but it's a rocket ship. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to snap my fingers and start to uh, uh, fire the rockets. And the thing will begin to accelerate and go from zero speed to start to moving up. OK? And exactly at the time, for convenience, exactly at the time I, I fire the rockets, I'm going to shine uh, 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 a light. And the light is aimed horizontally. So in the static case, that's just sitting here, no gravity, no acceleration. It's just floating in space, sitting still. I'm going to shine a beam of light, and it's just going to go across. I'm also going to shine the same beam of light starting from the same height in this accelerating rocket ship. I'm going to start at the same time. And, the, and in both cases, the light's going to move horizontally. And the light's minding its own business, and we're going to see what it's going to do. 
So let me do the animation. I'm sorry, the thing's a little pixelated, but this is, this is the best version of it that I can find to make my point. So here we go, and we're going to loop the movie. So OK. So this thing is floating in space, sitting still. You shoot the shine the light bulb across. The, la the laser beam goes from one side to the other. It starts at this height. It ends at that height. Now over here, we have a different story. We fire the rockets at the same time we start the light moving. But that means we start the light moving, the spacecraft wasn't moving yet. It was just starting to light the rocket, so it wasn't moving yet. So the light just, it's, it starts the same way it starts over here, and it just moves across in the same way. But underneath it, the spacecraft is accelerating. So by the time the light beam gets to the other side, the spacecraft is moved up, and so it hits lower on the wall. And so if you were sitting on this moving spacecraft, you would say, oh, that's interesting, because when I shine my light across the room, lo and behold, it seems to be droopy. It hit, the, it hit down near the floor on the other side and not at the same height where I aimed it. Isn't that peculiar? OK. And so that's, that's, uh, so that's the result of doing the rocket ship. But then if you take seriously this uh, equivalence principle, this has implications. And what's the implication? If this is the result in a rocket ship, it would be the same with gravity, which means. I don't know. <laughs> which means if this. If, that means if I were in a room where this is not a rocket ship, now it's just gravity, the result has to be the same, so the light will still droop if I shoot it across the room. And that's what we found out. Very good. And so if, it, if you have gravity then, and I shoot the light across the room, it will droop exactly the same way you experience it if you're living in a moving rocket, an accelerating rocket ship. That's, so, so far, this is just Einstein's claim. This is still theory land. OK. Please, yeah. Is this that theorized under a constant acceleration, or can it be accelerated? Oh, so, uh, oh, so to remind you, an acceleration for, for, the, for the civilians in the room. So acceleration just means your velocity is changing. So you're starting with zero velocity and gaining velocity, So because the thing's at rest, and then it's shooting upwards. Um, so uh, so the, the example here, it's a constant uh, acceleration. If it were not a constant acceleration, then life would get more complicated, and that would be equivalent to a, a not uniform gravity field. That's, that's, it's a very good question, and that, that, that's basically what that would amount to. Yeah. OK? So far, so good? So this is the prediction. So far, this is just theory land. Yeah? And the assumption on the middle one is that it's in space somewhere, not on Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. That's right. No gravity. It's floating gravity. in space. There's no gravity. The only thing that's going, they, they're both identical. They're both sitting at rest with respect to each other. No funny business. But then one shoots off the, the rockets, the other doesn't. And then you get this effect. OK? Great. So that's theory. So now uh, what we conclude is gravity bends the path of light. If Einstein's right, gravity bends the path of light. That's, the, that's a consequence of this, that's a consequence, not the only one, but a consequence of this equivalence principle. And so, let me now state it more assertively. So Einstein published this in 1915. It's called the general theory of relativity because it was a generalization of his special theory of relativity, which tells you what happens if you move fast but without gravity. And then in, 1950, in 1915, he generalized his special theory to now include the effects of gravity. And what he said is this amazing thing. It's this science fiction y sounding thing that gravity is a warping of space. In fact, it's even more than that. It's a warping of space and time. I won't have much time to talk about the time part of it, but it also is a warping of time. And the idea is that, uh, um, that he says gravity is not a force at all. He completely disagrees with Newton. He says it, an, an analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a pretty good analogy, is as if you had a rubber sheet. If space is a rubber sheet, it's like deformable. And if you had a rubber sheet and you stick heavy objects in it, the rubber sheet gets, uh, gets deflected. Um, and that, that the deflection is the strength of gravity. So the sun has a lot of gravity, so it distorts the space around it. A neutron star, which is a thing that's almost a black hole and will become very famous very soon, uh, is, uh, will, is very massive in a very small space. So it really has strong gravity, and it very much distorts space and time. And then a black hole is where you sort of maximally distort space and time. Uh, and so, uh, and then the idea is that, uh, and then that will distort the path of light. OK, so the Twitter version of general relativity, the slogan 
is, uh, uh, this is from John Wheeler, so the experts in the room, Sam is smiling because she knows he's a famous relativist. Uh, he actually died before there was Twitter, but if there were Twitter, he would have loved it. And this, so this is a fake tweet, it's, but, this is, but it's a real quote. And his famous quote is, matter tells space-time how to curve. So matter warps space. Matter is the source of gravity, and that's a warping of space. And, but then space tells matter how to move. So once it's warped, then you're moving in this warped space, and then you move in funny ways. And the idea is, for example, if you're the, uh, the moon uh, going around the Earth, uh, making eclipses and so forth, then what's happening is the Earth is distorting the space around it, and then the moon is moving in this funny distorted space, and so it zooms around in this funny curved path. And so that's a, so Einstein says there's no forces at all, it's all about warping of space. There's no, gra gravity's not a force. There are other forces, but gravity's not a force. It's a warping of space. Okay, very good. And so a consequence of this, which Einstein realized immediately, is, well, if massive objects warp space, then that affects the motion not only of planets, but of light. It affects the motions of everything to include light. And so, the, and the closer you get to the gravitating object, the more light is warped. And so the idea goes like this. So this is Einstein's original sketch, which is hard for you to read. So I'll go up to this sketch, which is easier to read. So imagine we have a star, and the star is here. This is very not to scale, by the way. Uh, so we have a star here, so it's light goes in all directions, and here's a light beam that in the absence of uh, this massive object, this light beam would actually miss the Earth. If there's a different light beam it would shoot in the absence of the sun that would hit the Earth, but this is a light beam that otherwise was, was destined to miss the Earth. But if I put a nice massive object like the sun, it distorts the space, and so that curves the light beam. The light beam follows this curved space as best it can, and then it hits the Earth. And so that's interesting, because that means, because we normally don't imagine space being curved, so we just see when the starlight comes, we assume the star is in the direction where it, that points back. So we would say, oh, the star seemed to have been in this location. But it's not. But it's not. And in fact, if you move this thing away, it would go back to being in that location, so you'd, be, you'd see a shift in the position of the star. And so you'd see a deflection of starlight. And this is a little bit hard for you to read, so here's his sketch. This is the sun, and he sketches what this deflection should be. If you come near the sun, where the gravity is the strongest, right towards the edge of the sun, it's hard for you to read this, but it's 0.84 arc seconds. That is not very much angle, uh, so it's hard to bend uh, space, and even the sun has trouble bending it a lot. So this angle here is drastically exaggerated if that's the sun. It's really a tiny fraction of a degree, one arc second, basically. And so, uh, Einstein says, okay, well, great, I would like to test this. So we just need to see stars whose light comes near the sun and see if they're bent by the, see if their direction now is changed, apparently changed, due to the presence of the sun, and then we can test this theory. It's beautiful. Um, and he actually asks astronomers, it's actually not a stupid question, is there some way you can see stars during the day, because obviously the sun is usually up during the day and this would cause a problem. Can you see, you know, can you, near the sun, could you still manage to see a star somehow if you're clever? And they're like, no, Al, that's not gonna work. And so, so that's bad. Uh, so, uh, so how are we gonna get around that? Eclipse, obviously. obviously, I'm here talking, so we go about by having an eclipse. And so, that's of course exactly the idea. And I, I told you Einstein published his theory in 1915, and he brought up this test. He made this calculation and made it clear what we wanted to do. That was in 1915. Uh, the test didn't happen until 1919. That's a long time. And uh, it's not that people couldn't, there, there were eclipses between, total eclipses between 1915 and 1919, but nobody did the experiment then. And it's not for scientific reasons. It's because people were killing themselves in World War I and they couldn't go and do, do cute astronomy projects. But after World War I, there was a British expedition, there was an eclipse on May uh, 29 of 1919, so we're almost to the 100 year anniversary, and there was this British expedition that went to Brazil and West Africa, and, uh, um, and then they took an image of the eclipse, and remember I said you could see, star, you yourself saw, the, saw that you could see things near the sun, so they did that took an image of it, and we were kind of lucky. In that eclipse, there were some fairly bright stars that were very near the edge of the sun, so it was particularly favorable. And they took an image, and I'll show you the image from their actual publication. 
and that's it. So by now, the sun and the corona are very, you know, the eclipse sun and the corona are familiar to you. You can see these dots here, uh, and lo and behold, the, the, the little lines there to guide your eye. So they indeed saw the stars that were near the sun, and they could measure their position. You know what stars they are, so you, you find the positions of all the stars you can see, measure their positions, you know how they normally are on the sky when the sun isn't there, and you can measure the deflection if there is any. And let me now show you the result. So first I'll show you the scientific paper. So the person who led this is the famous British, actually theoretical astrophysicist, uh, our, Sir Arthur Eddington, and also another gentleman who was the astronomer royal at the time. And so this is a determination of the deflection of light by the sun's gravitational field from observations made at the total eclipse. That's our theme today of May 29, 1919. And here's the, a piece of their abstract. It's short enough, I'll just read it to you. Thus, the results of the expedition to Sobral and Principe can leave little doubt that a deflection of light takes place in the neighborhood of the sun, and it is of the amount demanded by Einstein's generalized theory of rel relativity as attributable to the sun's gravitational field. So he's saying Einstein is right, and general relativity isn't just a crazy idea, it's the law. Um, so that's the scientific publication, and you see this was read in November 6, 1919. This got some attention in the media. So this is how the scientists talk to each other. Let's see how the press picked it up. Let's find out what the New York Times had to say. So this is November 10th. It's a few days later. So let's see what the New York Times had to say. Here's the headline. Lights all askew in the heavens. <laughs> men of science, men, right? Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein theory triumphs. Stars were not where they seem to be. No one need worry. I love this. No one need worry. <laughs> Uh, and it goes on. So this is the confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And in fact, this is when Einstein went from being uh, you know, famous to physicists, but not famous to anybody else, to being a household word. So this is when Einstein became Einstein, this. So an eclipse is what made Einstein. I mean, Einstein's ideas made him Einstein, but the, but the proof in the eclipse experiment he proposed is what made him famous, a household name. All right? Yeah, that's right. Because of the war, he was Jewish, and then because of the war, he came. That's right. That's right. And so, but this was before. He was still in Germany at the time, uh, in Berlin. And of course, uh, and he became the person of the century back to this, this thing which we call the magazine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, 100 years later, I don't want to leave you with the impression that that was the end of the subject. So now we're still interested in this. Uh, and in fact, now we can use Einstein's ideas and push them further. So now, let's go to a much bigger scale. Let's not just do this with stars uh, and the sun. Let's use much bigger objects. So let's use galaxies. So this, again, is a picture horribly not to scale. So imagine we're so lucky that the, the universe is full of galaxies. We live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. There are many galaxies, billions of them. They're randomly strewn, more or less, in the universe. And uh, in general, they're kind of random. But every once in a while, just by dumb luck, you'll have two that are lined up so they're all in the same line of sight. Doesn't happen all the time, it's kind of unusual, but once in a while, by chance, it happens. So we'll call this one the foreground galaxy because it's nearer, we'll call this one the background galaxy because it's further away. And the idea is this foreground galaxy is full of a bunch of stuff, it's got a bunch of mass, so it gravitates, which means it's distorting the space around it. That means that if it's perfectly lined up, the background galaxy, it's light, some of it will just come straight through, but then, you know, it's going through the foreground galaxy, you probably miss the whole thing. But then the neat thing is, there'll be a light ray from this background galaxy that was going to miss us, but then got bent by the gravity and will come towards us. And then there's one downstairs that was going to miss us and still will come towards us. And it's a three-dimensional problem, I can't draw this, but there's a light ray coming out of the board that was going to miss us, but then gets pulled towards us. And so if you collect together all the light rays and now ask yourself, what would you actually view in a telescope? So you're looking towards this galaxy, this whole system, because uh, they're all lined up. What will you actually see in the telescope? There we go. I saw a nice hand drawing. You'll see a ring. First, you'll obviously see the foreground galaxy you'll see as a galaxy, but then around it, you'll see a ring. That's the prediction, and it would look something like this. So you'll see the foreground galaxy here, and then the background galaxy will be a ring uh, stretched around it. That's the idea, and the, so now let's, that's interesting thing to do. Let's go do the experiment. 
And when you go do the experiment, we've actually done that. This is one of our faculty members, our young up and coming faculty members, Joaquin Vieira. And uh, this is uh, not a simulation or an artist's conception. This is a real image. So here is the foreground galaxy, and here's the background galaxy distorted into a ring. That's a beautiful thing that's known as an Einstein ring. So this is an example now on galaxy scales of, uh, of, uh, of light, light bending by gravity. And there's more, uh, because you could even step further back and do this with whole clusters of galaxies. There are places in space, they're a little unusual, but there are places in space where galaxies clump together and you get hundreds of them all in a, in a relatively small space. So this is called a cluster of galaxies. There might be a hundred or several hundred galaxies here. And then behind it, there's some innocent galaxy minding some business very far away. So now the entire cluster of galaxies is the source of gravity bending light and there's some very distant galaxy whose light comes through and get, gets bent. So you do that, so then you go look, and lo and behold, this is what you see. So you see the cluster of galaxies, that's all these golden things, or these, these are all members of this cluster of galaxies. But then you see these crazy little arcs, and every one of those little arcs is the same background galaxy, being its light is being distorted as it goes through. It's amazing. Uh, so we're seeing gravitational lensing on galaxy scales, and the other thing you can do, there's more. The amount of bending is controlled by the amount of mass there, because that's the source of gravity. So you can also use this to weigh the cluster of galaxies and find out how much mass is there. And what you find is the total amount of mass that you need to explain the lensing is much more than the amount of mass that you can account for by the lit up stuff here in the form of stars and gas. And so it tells you that there's a lot of mass here that you aren't seeing. That mass is unseen, but there, and so it tells you that galaxies are mostly made of dark matter. That's also true for the, uh, the other, the single galaxy result I just showed you as well. Those little things are called lensing? Yeah, so this is called gravitational lensing, and these are, are, are arc. Yeah, these are gravitationally lens arcs, and all of them are carbon copies of the original galaxy, so you can, you can even recover that, you know. The, 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 the galaxy behind, and it got warped, uh, you know, because like if you put a big lens between me and you, you know, you'll look funny, and there'll be little arcs. But you know, if you know the properties of the lens, you can even recover and find out what the original galaxy looks like. Really cool. Yeah. So, okay. All right. We're running way late, but I wanted to say one more thing because I can't not say this. This wasn't. This is not really an eclipse thing. But we already talked about how general relativity is this amazing thing. You've gotten a sense of how fantastic it is. But something which I said, it's a warping of space and time. So here's the thing. So far, we focused on if we have a single gravitating object, maybe a star, maybe a galaxy, maybe a cluster of galaxies, and how it warps space. But what if I have two massive things and they're in motion? Then they warp each other, so they feel each other's distortions, and they move in a funny orbit. But then, remember the rubber sheet analogy, all of this motion launches waves in the rubber sheet. Well, there's not really a rubber sheet, it's space and time, but it causes these ripples in space and time. So these are known as gravitational waves, and they propagate out at a calculable speed, which turns out to be speed of light. And so that is another prediction that was about 100 years ago. So Einstein made that prediction as well, and it took us 100 years to catch up with them. So there's, you've heard of this. There's this famous experiment called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory, which involves two large buildings and long arms. And what they're basically doing is hanging big masses that they monitor. And the idea is we're really rippling space. And so that means there are these wiggles in space. And so if I get mass, gravity talks to mass, and I wiggle these, these, big, uh, uh, these big masses, and I shine laser light between them so I can tell if the distance between them is changing because there's a gravity wave coming through, then I can detect the gravity wave. I said that like that's easy to do. I, I cannot emphasize enough how not easy that is to do because the, the motion is very tiny. Because of course, and the thing I have to emphasize, these gravity waves aren't just wiggling our little rocks, our little masses. They're wiggling the entire Earth, but in imperceptible amounts. Um, and amazingly, they found some. Basically, they switched it on at its full capacity, and bang, they found something. So here are the wiggles. So there's a station in Hanford, Washington in the northwest uh, where they found a signal. There's another station in Louisiana separated by thousands of miles. They found the same signal, so they know there's no funny business. You lay them on top of each other, they're the same. 
and so they found a source of gravitational radiation. And the thing that's not obvious from this is from the wiggles, the, the literally distortions of space that you were measuring, you can work out what was causing this, and what was causing this was the merger of two black holes, each about 30 times the mass of the sun, merging to form, merging to eventually form a single black hole that then settled down and stopped ringing. Over what period of time? Uh, a fraction of a second, milliseconds. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're mutually eating each other and forming a single huge black hole. Uh, so they, they were almost the same mass. Um, and this is amazing for like 10 reasons. So we're, we didn't even know for sure there are 30 solar mass black holes. So not only do they exist, but they apparently, some of them exist in binary pairs, which form, live their lives, and manage to merge within the lifetime of the universe and then form a single black hole, and all of this is measurable. And for, the, for all the world, that looks like a photograph. What is that? What's... Oh, the thing on the bottom? Yeah. Oh, this is an artist's conception. Okay. Yeah, this is like, if you were there, which I wouldn't recommend, uh, then, then, then as the things were merging, they would lens the light around them, and so this is the, the gravitational lensing is also going on at the same time. Yeah, the object's deep inside the black area where you're not going to get it. Where it yeah, so, so these, as these are merging, they make these very strong waves. The strongest waves are right when they merge together and form the black hole, and then the black hole sort of calms down. And the, so this is, this is the black hole being born, and this is it ringing down and settling down to a, a static state. So this is, your, this is the birth of a black hole right here. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they just switch it on and wait, and then you know, the universe provides signals, and we don't know when they're going to come, but when they do, oh my god, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, and the part of why I'm saying this is, first of all, that is cool enough that, that that got the Nobel Prize just a few weeks ago, and the, the people who designed the experiment and made it work uh, were led this team of thousands of people, and they got the Nobel Prize in physics to these people, Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. And rightly so. They were a lock. I was completely convinced they were going to get the Nobel Prize. This, this is so amazing. Um, and please. Oh, it, it does happen all the time, and by now they've seen three other merging black holes. Uh, so if I had more time, I would show you that too. Yeah, yeah. So, and in fact, up up till now, oh, these are far away. You're totally safe. But up till now, up till now, we've only seen merging black holes, or I should say, it has only been publicized that there have been merging black holes. But there is going to be a major announcement on Monday. It's going to be on social media. It's going to be on the news. You're going to hear all about it. I'm not directly privy to it, but there are all kinds of rumors. We basically already know what they're going to say. And on Monday, they're going to say they found another thing. Not black holes merging, but one of these neutron stars. That's what they're going to do. It's going to be super amazing, because when the neutron stars merge, they burp and make a lot of light. And so we're actually going to see pictures now of what this looks like. So and that's going to be on Monday. So I, I could not tell you that. All right, so we're horribly running late. So we've already had questions, so now I want to give Sam a chance. So this room is about education and outreach, and I'm proud to say that astronomy now has a thriving outreach group, the Astro Illini. Graduate students and postdocs, the young people are really leading it. Faculty are involved. We have some alumni who are involved. And they do all kinds of things. They do Astro School programs. We have a monthly observatory open house, which you can go to. Uh, we do science at the market, at the uh, farmer's market in Urbana. We do astronomy on tap, which is what it sounds like. You go have a beer at Pizza M in Urbana, and there's going to be one next Thursday. And after this announcement on Monday, you want to go to the one on Thursday. Uh, and then on homecoming, we're going to have an op open house at well at, at the campus observatory. So uh, in the remaining moments, then uh, Sam's going to show you some of what they do. Can you hear me now? Awesome. All right, so I'm going to be talking about um, planets. 
Uh, so we all know all the planets, and for this case, I'm going to consider Pluto as a planet just because it's so near and dear to my heart. Um, so I will need at least two volunteers. If you could come up here, maybe. Awesome. I mean, you do get to play with Plato. There we go. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So first off, we're going to make a model solar system. So let's pretend that I've squashed all of the planets together and I've made this super planet. So as we are making this model solar system, I want you guys to try and think about if all of the planets are this big squashed together, how big would the sun be? So first off, let's start off um, by making uh, a first approximation to Jupiter. So first, one of you, uh, divide that in two. All right, so that one of those, so that goes on Jupiter. Um, then you divide that into five. <laughs> Roll it out into a log. That's why I have a knife. <laughs> also, be thinking about how big you think Pluto is. Any guesses? Yeah? You're, you'll see. It's, you're pretty close. Um, right? I'm actually surprised that Jupiter is half. So we're not done yet. Yeah, so we actually have quite a bit more to add on to Jupiter. Yes. Yes, it's more than half. That's pretty good. All right, so one of those goes on to Jupiter again. And then squish two of them together to make Saturn. Well, first approximation to Saturn. All right, so now, so two, three into Saturn. So then we squish these two together. Um, well, actually, don't do that yet. Um, so one of those goes on to Jupiter again. All right. And then please divide that into five. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's usually easier to do it via snake, I guess, or log. All right, so two of those on, go on to, well, squish two of those together to make Neptune, and then squish two of them together to make Uranus. All right, so can you divide that into two? Oh, yeah. All right, one of those goes on to Saturn. <laughs> and then if you could divide that into two again. All right, and one of those halves also goes on to Saturn. <laughs> All right, so now you get to divide that into five. Please. <laughs> I think Try picking up these. Oh, yeah. Mars and Earth. Yep. This is the all time great practice. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you're, ju you're just automatically finishing grad school with this incredible activity. Exactly. You know, this is, this is my capstone. <laughs> All right, so one of those is going to be Earth. One of them is going to be Venus. And then two go on to Uranus. All right, so we have one more left. Five. <laughs> and we're not done yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, it always does. 
So do we have any guesses as to how big the sun would be? Well, substantially bigger than all of them put together. You are correct. I, I, I but how much? So this big, this big, big as a beach ball? Yeah, how big? Probably a beach oh. ball or beyond. Yeah. Okay, so you got five there. So two of those go on to Neptune. Okay. Two of those go on to Uranus. And then could you divide the remaining one in half? <laughs> Uranus? Uh, Uranus. Neptune and Uranus. Okay. Yeah. So one half goes, that is Mars. Tiny. Yep. Um, so divide that into two. And we're not done yet. <laughs> so one of those is Mercury. And then, no. <laughs> yes. Five? Five. You get that photograph. Does anyone have a smaller knife? <laughs> Try using the back. <laughs> or your fingernails. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we still, so after this five, we still have uh, two more steps. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You have a lot of fun with this with the kids. Don't you? Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, great. yeah, we'll be making the planets, and I'll see little crumbs of Pluto everywhere. All right, so two of those go on to Mercury. <laughs> two of those go on to Uranus. All right, so divide that in half. Not five, huh? We're not. We're, it's the next, this is the next to last one. All right, so one goes on to Uranus. And then, no. yes, <laughs> yes, five? divide that into five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, imagine, <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right. Just one more. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So four of those go into Uranus. Uh, and then the last one <laughs> and then the last one is Pluto. Jeez. <laughs> How big is our moon? It's super tiny. <laughs> okay. Okay. So <laughs> exactly. It's this tiny little speck right here. It's about the size of a biggish gra grain of sand, I guess. Um, here, than yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why Pluto is a dwarf planet. It's, it's so tiny. Um, but you guys still haven't answered my question. How big do you think the sun would be on this scale? <laughs> All right, so no, you a little bit too big. Um, it is bigger than a bread box, though. <laughs> so if the sun were on this scale, it would be about this big in diameter, just to give you a good. Um, yeah. So. Now here is the model solar system, and I will hand it back to Brian. All right. So I, I know. So because we don't have a lot of time left, let me uh, uh, let me just uh, go quick. So, so we heard about exoplanets. We heard about planets. Oh, thank you, Sam. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and Sam is actually more knowledgeable about planets than me, but that doesn't stop me uh, from talking about them. So eclipses are also important for planets. So we are in the age of discovery of planets. So first of all, I have to mention something that's super cool and didn't, I think, get enough press during the eclipse. There's this amazing thing that the, the moon in the sky takes up about half a degree across of angle, and the sun takes up about half a degree across. They have, so what the deal with that is the sun, of course, is vastly bigger than the moon. They aren't the same physical size. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. That's one of the exercises. We, but it's 400 times further away, and lo and behold, they are about the same angular size on the sky. They take up about the same amount of sky, but way different amounts of space. Um, because of that, the, sun, the moon just fits over the sun, and we get a total eclipse. But because also the orbits of the planets are not perfect circles, they're ellipses with the sun at one focus, and the orbit of the moon around the Earth is an ellipse with the Earth at one focus, that means the distances between the Earth and the sun and the Earth and the moon, those distances change a little bit. So that means sometimes the sun is slightly bigger in the sky, sometimes slightly smaller in the sky, and sometimes the moon is slightly bigger in the sky and slightly smaller in the sky. And because of that, it sometimes happens when the sun is bigger in the sky and the moon is smaller in the sky, that even when you put the moon right between us and the sun, it can't cover the entire sun, and you get this annulus, this ring of sun popping out. That's not what happened two months ago. We had a total eclipse. But once in a while, you can have the other kind that's called an annular eclipse. And that's really cool, but you don't get to see the corona, so it's basically not as cool. Um, annular eclipse, you're on campus for 79. Exactly so, exactly so. And then you didn't have to even go anywhere. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, 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 and there'd be little circles on the ground. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I would love to see one, but this was super cool. Okay, so this is an amazing thing. The fact that the side, the angular size of the, uh, the, the moon and the sun are the same, that's one of the biggest coincidences in all of astrophysics, in my opinion. There's no reason this happens, which it just is. But the point is that that isn't always the case. So for example, when Venus goes between us and the sun, Venus is not the same size as the sun on the sky and in physical space either. So every once in a while, Venus comes between us and the sun, and you get what's called a transit of Venus. And so this happened, oh, several years ago. And there's, so that's an actual image. There's Venus, and it's blocking up part of the sun. There, it's not the same size as the sun, so the whole sun isn't blocked just a little bit. And so that's an eclipse. It's not a total eclipse, but it's still an eclipse. And this is an actual image taken from a space uh, mission where you can see uh, there's Venus, there's the sun, it's blocking the sun. But interesting, you notice some of the light from the sun goes through Venus's atmosphere, so you see a little bit of halo there. Isn't that cool? That's um, kind of neat for finding the atmosphere of Venus. Yeah. So, so now imagine we're interested in planets, not just uh, around the sun, but around other stars. So imagine we're looking at a distant star where the star is just a dot. I can't take a picture like this anymore. I can do it for the sun, but imagine it's a distant star. Then all I see is a dot of light in the sky. Uh, how can I detect? There's more than one way, but how can I detect the planet? There you go. If we're so lucky that the planet goes between us and the star, then there will be a reduction in the light. And so the way I detect it is I look at the star, and I see if the light gets a little dimmer. And that's, in fact, so here's the idea, this little sketch. If the planet comes between us and the star, and you're monitoring the brightness of the star over time, then as the planet goes between us and the star, boop, the star gets a little dimmer, and the boop, it goes back. That's the idea. So now, it turns out, like people, stars burp and belch all the time. Sometimes they get a little brighter, a little dimmer. And this is not a very big effect. This is like a 1% change in brightness. So you have to make a super careful measurement. So how, how can we assure this star wasn't just belching? Uh, and the way you be sure is, so to be sure it's a planet and not just a random belch of the star. That's one way to do it. There's an even, there's an even like, simpler way to do it with the same experiment. You wait for it to happen again, because if the planet's going around the star, this will keep happening again and again and again. Yeah. And so the brightness will get dimmer again and again in a regular, predictable way. And if you measure that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as it goes across the star, first it's blocking part of the star and then more, and the star isn't actually uniformly bright across its surface. And so you can predict, based on where it crosses the star, this actually gives you. Because there's more yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole story about why the star is, because is, as, as, as you're looking at the star at, at different slants, you see different amounts of stuff. Yeah, there's a name for this called limb darkness. Yeah, very good, very good. That's exactly right. Please. Isn't there somewhere that I can go and find pictures like this of the transit 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, this is a cartoon, but the dots here are actually from real data. Um, and in fact, they're not from a single, what actually happens is it goes across, this, we've added multiple of these crossings all together to make this picture, so we've wrapped it around. Um, and when you do this, you learn more because you can also say how long did it take to see the planet again. Well, that's telling you how long it takes the planet to go around the star. So this measurement not only tells you there's a planet, but it gives you the period of the planet going around the star. And furthermore, by measuring how much the star dimmed, you see how much of the light the, the, the planet was blocking. And if you know something about the star, it tells you the size of the planet compared to the size of the star. It tells you the radius of the planet. So you not only detect the planet, but you can measure its properties. Um, so we're running late. So uh, let me just say that there's more, you, much more you can do with this. Uh, but let me, uh, uh, let me just, I'll end with, uh, the holy grail of this is you can actually measure something about whether the planet has life. But I'll just throw that out to entice you and then go to my conclusion slide. So I hope I've convinced you eclipses are laboratories for fundamental physics and astrophysics. So they tell us that uh, uh, they proved general relativity, made Einstein Einstein, tell us about dark matter, map it out, and tell us uh, that there's new worlds. Uh, and don't, re don't forget the things I said. If you want to do more astronomy, please do. So we've got astronomy on tap. That's the next Thursday. We've got, you can go to Facebook and you can find out when these things are. Every, uh, every month we have an observatory open house on our web page. You can find that. And this homecoming will have stuff as well. So there's more astronomy in your future if you're interested. And with that, thank you very much. Oh, uh -huh. well, 1400 local just happened to be right there, so it was clear, and all of a sudden the sunspot started and started going nuts. And as the sunspot started, oh, that's great. Going back, 1400 came back in. It was really oh, that's crazy. awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I'm intrigued by how an exoplanet can tell you about life on it. Is that, is that another hour? No. I can do it in less than an hour. Since, since you ask, it turns out I have a slide for that. Uh, so here's the idea. Remember I showed you with Venus that when the planet goes, with Venus you saw this already, when the planet blocks the light of the star, some of the, if the planet has an atmosphere, it doesn't have to have an atmosphere by the way, that's an experimental question, but if it does have an atmosphere, then some of the light will peek through the atmosphere. So when the, when the planet is dimming the star, some of the light you see will have gone through the atmosphere of the planet. And so, if you're very clever, then you can look to see if there's an effect of that. And lo and behold, you can do that. So here is exactly that. So you measure, is there an effect due just to, so you subtract out the light of the star and look just for the light going through the atmosphere. And then, and that's what the funny data here are the little dots. And then the, the blue is appropriately colored. That's a model of what it would be like if the planet had water in its atmosphere and the molecules absorb at different wavelengths, which is what this is. And lo and behold, it exactly fits the pattern of water. This planet has water in it. Actually, it's even better because then when the planet is not blocking the star, the planet still reflects light of the star. And if you reflect light off of the planet, that also encodes information about what the planet is made of. And so for the, uh, for the reflected light, the emitted light, then uh, this is the pattern you would get from water. The dots are the data. And lo and behold, you see that as well. And so these two are both consistent with each other and tell you this planet has water. So we only see a dot in the sky. The star is just a dot in the sky. But by being clever using eclipse technology, we can start to tell you what the planet is made. It has an atmosphere, and that atmosphere contains water. Yes, and there is active research. Sam knows more about this than I do. There's active research right now trying to do that. And future telescopes that are about, there's a thing about to be launched called the James Webb Space Telescope. And one of its main missions, which is not when it was designed, but now is going to be to look for other molecules to include uh, 
maybe more interesting molecules that, uh, that don't occur naturally, and that's what I was alluding to. So this is chlorophyll, and good luck actually finding chlorophyll. I just did that to be provocative. But the idea is there's this raging debate right now, what chemical signatures do you want to look for that would be really a signature of life? And that is not a trivial question at all, but it's a super interesting thing to be debating. And so, uh, and this is going to happen. Like in the next 10 years, this is going to happen. We're going to find crazy stuff, and who knows what we're going to conclude from it. Sam, you know more about this than I do. Any, anything I, I left out? No, not really. Yeah. The, the amplitude of that graph, did that tell you how much there is? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, the, exactly. So, um, and yeah, and what it, it, it doesn't, it, it tells you how much how much water there is as you went through the atmosphere. Not how much is on the planet, because most of it just blocked the light, but in the bit of atmosphere you saw through, so the sort of semi-transparent bit, it tells you how abundant water was there. Exactly so, exactly so. So you can not only find, you can find the humidity on the planet, basically. There's even more. It turns out you can find out about weather. I mean, you can go, there's amazing stuff you can do with this. I haven't even, I haven't done it all justice. There's an amazing amount you can learn from this. Yeah, so that, that's one of the questions is what, what chemical signatures make you confident there's no way you can get this except with life? And the, I, this isn't my research at all, but my impression is the, the, the thinking is probably any individual chemical signature, if you think hard enough, you can find some, some inanimate way of making it. But probably with combinations of signatures, you can start to say this really looks like it's out of equilibrium. It's very hard to see how this would happen naturally. That really it has to be something going on on the planet itself, you know, some some life process going on. But that, and, and as you start to find things, then that, that will become a raging debate: Have we really discovered life? And there'll be, you know, lots of uh, there'll be lots of interesting things to argue about. So we're far away from, you know, talking to ET. But like, but we really will learn a lot in the next ten years. We will know a lot about the atmospheres of nearby planets, and this will not just be science fiction. Now we can have real discussions about what we're seeing. Yeah. Very good. I don't know a whole lot about life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and of course that's a whole. T so right. So in introductory astronomy courses, uh, we spend you know a good week telling people about the properties of light and how light interacts with matter and why you get these barcodes that correspond to water and other. So yeah, we spend so like it, uh, so like. A short digestible version would be an introductory astronomy material, which is you know, with textbooks and stuff online. Yeah, because it's exactly right. Because you, you, you're very observant. So astronomy, um, except for Plato, is mostly a case of you can look but you can't touch. So the light, we have to be incredibly clever about light. You exactly picked up on the key thing. We have to be incredibly clever about understanding light because everything we learn is by decoding light. Um, and so Sam will tell you, we have whole courses on the interaction between light and matter and why things look the way they do. And we have entire courses on that because you've got to have a black belt in that. So Sam has a black belt in that because you need to know that if you're an astronomer because in general, you can look but you can't touch. And so, you, so looking is everything. And that's part of why we're also we're excited about the gravity waves because that's another way of looking at the universe without light at all. Because the, the other thing I should have said is those crazy big tubes in the bottom of the, you know, with laser beams and so forth that, that, that measure these gravity waves, that's a telescope. That's the other thing. That, that, that is the same way, you know, it's nothing like a tube with a lens on the end, but that is a telescope measuring the universe. And like I said, it's going to tell us something really cool in about 48 hours. Yeah. yeah. It did, but, uh, uh, but not unscathed is my impression. I mean, you know, Puerto Rico has more fundamental problems than that. But yeah, I think it survived, but not unscathed. Yeah. That, that's the big radio telescope on, uh, on uh, Puerto Rico. Beautiful. Yeah. And light is not just a visual spectrum. Oh, yeah, please, please. We're, we're, we're adults here. So yeah, <laughs> visible light, you know, visible light is, you know, what you start out with. But oh, yeah, so we're interested in. The, the universe emits light across the electromagnetic spectrum. So everything from radio waves, infrared, visible light, but then all the way up to microwave, radio, all, everything, gamma rays, x-rays, all of that. And we're interested in all of that. But just to be clear, the gravity waves is a whole different thing. Gravity waves are a whole different thing. So electromagnetic waves are about light. They're about electricity and magnetism. Gravity is totally different from that. And it's a whole new way of looking at the universe.
And that's, that's like the future. That's 21st century uh, astronomy. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.